Welcome to the presentation, Dynamic Self-Tuning, Flickering and Shedding in Buoyant Droplet Diffusion Flames under Acoustic Excitation. Normally, people are very conversant with buoyant diffusion flames, but however, buoyant diffusion flames has got their own interesting physics in that that show flickering, which are inherently present due to the buoyant nature of the flame. But however, most of the work has been done with a fixed fuel source. The work on droplet diffusion flames, which are buoyant in nature, nobody has looked into the inherent instabilities in that much details. So we are going to look at two things. We are going to look at the characteristics of the buoyant diffusion flame, as well as the effect of acoustic forcing on such a buoyant diffusion flame in terms of the heat release response and a new shedding criteria. Shedding criteria is at which the flame basically pinches off. So the flickering of the buoyant diffusion flame, as I said, is has been studied quite a bit. So there is the work of Zia et al. who found that the shedding frequency of such a buoyant diffusion flame basically scales as root over G by L0, where L0 is basically the size of the fuel source. It can be a nozzle, it can be a porous sphere, which is weighted with the liquid. In most cases, this fuel source is constant. As a result, this length scale does not get altered. But however, this is not the same in the case of a droplet diffusion flame. And here we will see the flame spectral response and the shedding criteria are quite a bit different. So these are the experimental setups. So we did high speed OH chemiluminescence as well as shillerine experiments as well as high speed flow visualizations at different framing rates as it is mentioned in the slides. Let us look at the pertinent questions over here. In the case of an unforced droplet diffusion buoyant flame, you will find that as the diameter of the droplet reduces, the flame slowly and steadily starts to show some higher frequency response. And this is present both for unforced as well as for forced flames. However, when you actually have acoustics in this particular problem, you will find that the flame becomes more aggravated in the presence of forcing. Also, it is to be noted that the flame shedding height at which the flame basically pinches off also reduces when you actually force the flame. So all these three observations are highly interesting and we will try to address these questions in details that why there is a temporal evolution in the droplet flame frequencies and what is the role of acoustic frequency and amplitude on the shedding criteria as well as this aggravated response. Let us look at the global observations of the flame. When you actually excite the flame using acoustics, the RMS pressure becomes very important. So when you normalize the RMS pressure by the corresponding atmospheric pressure, you will find that the flame becomes less and less quiescent as the RMS pressure increases. That means the flame becomes more and more violent, so to say. The flame spectral response also shows that for both forced as well as unforced flames, the flame response frequencies becomes higher and higher as the lifetime of the flame increases. At the same time, its shedding height starts to come down with the increase of acoustic forcing. Let us look at the qualitative response of the flame to acoustics. As you can see, as you go on increasing the acoustics, that means the P prime, essentially the flame transitions from a sinuous motion to a shedding motion to a partial extinction. In this particular case, one thing is to be noted that the U prime, which is basically the velocity that is induced by the acoustics also increases. And this velocity is of the same order as a natural circulation velocity that the flame inherently generates. So the flame inherent natural velocity is of the order of 0.21 meter per second. And all these velocities are very close to that. In the case of partial extinction, however, we have more forced convection effect as we will see later. So the flame response zones, if I have to analyze it, there are basically three parts, regime one, regime two, and regime three. Now in regime one, which is basically below the equatorial plane of the flame, you will see that there is bulk oscillatory motion, which actually responds to the acoustic frequency. So this bulk oscillatory motion is basically just the readjustment of the stoichiometric plane. So these oscillations does not lead to any perturbations of either the flame topography or the heat release. However, in regime two, this is the most important part because this is the instability growth region. So all the perturbations leads to circulation buildup, which ultimately reaches a critical value at H critical. And that is the point where the flame basically detaches. So you can see this flame flicker because of this periodic detachment of these vortices. And they require a certain convective length scale to build up. Regime three is the region which is beyond the shedding zone. And this is a part that we actually have not considered in details in this particular work. 
If you look at the spectral signature of the flame and map it with the acoustics, you will find the acoustics, no matter at what frequency you are actually exciting, trying to excite the flame, it is only gets locked in the low frequency band, which is basically a very small region normally, which is the buoyant unstable mode of the flame normally. This is about 6 to 22 hertz. It can be higher uh, depending on what is the size of the droplet. Now, as you can see over here from the pictures of no excitation to one kilohertz excitation, all the frequency bands are present in both no excitation as well as one kilohertz excitation cases. However, some of the frequencies carries more energy because of the feeding through the acoustics. And as a result of that, the flame gets augmented. That means the flame shows preferential perturbations at the low frequency band. Isolating this individual low frequency oscillations is one of the most important things. So here we conjecture that by looking at the R2 zone of the flame, that there must be multiple convective length scales that corresponds to this multispectral response of the flame heat release. In order to understand that, what we did was that we took a time series data of the heat release. We put a bandpass filter around a frequency of choice where F is a specific frequency, we did an inverse Fourier transform and we reconstructed these filtered images, which basically corresponds to that particular frequency. This allows us basically to look at each of the individual frequency and how do they grow in terms of a convective length scale. So indeed what you see that when you change the frequency from 12, 15, 20 and 25 Hertz, you do see the hot spot, these bright spots of the flame actually moving. So these bright spots move up to a particular length scale, which is also shown over here. If we track a certain bright spot and this particular length scale age is basically the convective length scale that we are concerned with. Now try to transfer this information to a frequency response domain. You will find that the frequency of excitation we propose should scale as root over G by H. So each of these convective length scales should ultimately correspond to the frequency by that relationship root over g by h. So what we mean here, if the frequency is 20 hertz, it should correspond to a corresponding h such that f is equal to root over g by h. And that is exactly what we see if we now plot the actual frequency response of the flame versus this root over g by h. And you see all the data are clustered along the theoretical line. So the flame shows exactly the same response as that root over g by h. So each frequency of response corresponds to a particular convective length scale. And that is exactly what we have observed in the filtered flame images as well. So this was an excellent thing. So this root over g by h response should be such that there, are, there can be multitude of these frequencies, h1, h2, h3, h4, so long and so forth. And all of them manifest in a certain frequency response of the flame. In addition to this, the interesting part is that if you remember the initial slide, we said that normally buoyant diffusion flames considers a constant quill source of a particular length scale. In the case of a droplet flame, however, it is not the case. So droplet flame actually shrinks in diameter. So ideally, we would expect that there will be higher order frequencies that should come naturally because of the reduction in the diameter of the droplet at later time scale. So in other words, this is indeed what we see when you actually did a, a continuous wavelet transform of the heat release. You see that some of these frequencies that you see over here, they evolve at a later time and initially they are not present. So initial frequencies which are there, there are additional frequencies which comes at a later stage of the flame because of the reduction in droplet diameter. And this is valid for both acoustically forced as well as unforced flame during the later stages of their combustion. So if we now propose that let there be an allowable frequency, which is less than or equal to root over of G by D, where D is the instantaneous diameter of the droplet, then our proposal is as this diameter of the droplet becomes smaller and smaller, the allowable frequency range becomes wider and wider. This is an envelope function. So any frequencies which are lower than this should be able to coexist. And that is the hypothesis that we are putting forward over here. So naturally the droplet diameter decreases as you can see in this particular function, typical like a D squared type of a plot. And as you can see the transient availability of the frequencies beyond what is inherently available already basically goes up because the droplet basically shrinks in diameter. 
So now let us look at the last portion that what about the shedding mechanism? So the shedding mechanism in a naturally buoyant droplet flame can be isolated by using the vorticity transport equation. So the main production of this circulation comes from the term in the vorticity transport equation. So what we do is that we find out what is the rate of change of circulation and then if we integrate it across a flicker cycle, here a flicker cycle basically means this is the height at which the flame should shed. So the flicker cycle and the flame height are basically correlated with each other. So if you integrate it, you should be able to get a critical value of circulation strength, which can be validated with experimental data as well, where the flame basically pinches off. So if we do this for unforced buoyant flames, you can see the critical circulation for unforced natural convection flame is basically given by this particular function. Now here you can see that the main component that comes into the picture is basically the velocity that is produced by the natural convection, which is UNC. And we have also taken into account the velocity inside and outside the flame and what is the differential in density between the two, right? So this is the critical circulation strength. However, if we now go for a forced droplet flame, as you can already see that there is a velocity that is produced by the acoustic forcing. We have already seen that earlier. So because of this velocity, we can write each of the components like the density of the flame and the air field, as well as the velocity that is produced in the air, as well as in the flame by using these functions. These are periodic functions. Once again, you can write a similar expression for the initial circulation, as you can see over here, in line to what we wrote for a natural convection flame without any forcing. And then we actually try to write this whole equation now, once again, in a very similar form. And then we integrate it using once again a flickered cycle. And then the critical parameter is the critical circulation strength, which is given by this now. The only addition that you see over here comes from the additional circulation that is produced by this acoustic field or the velocity that is produced by this acoustic field. So if you look at this particular term, this term is extra. So it, it is natural that this critical circulation will be arrived at a lower height. That is because there is an additive term that has been added to the overall circulation. So this is exactly what we see by shortening of the flame shedding height in the case of a forcing flame. But the interesting part over here is that this critical value is independent of the excitation frequency. It is only dependent on the amplitude of the acoustics, which in turn depends on the velocity field that is produced by the acoustics. So the shedding criteria now can be now cast in this particular form in which we can see that the shedding height in the case of forced flames in experimental space divided by the theory that we just now developed. Ideally, if you take a ratio of these two, the value will be close to one. But however, we see that there is a little bit of a spread, but most of the values are very close to one. So it shows that our theoretical framework is quite correct. It is indeed the additional velocity or basically the forced convection that is produced on the flame, which leads to this shortening of this shedding height. However, this velocity is very close to the natural circulation velocity, as we have seen over here. So if that crosses one, that means the forced velocity becomes more than the natural convection velocity the flame inherently has. The flame undergoes partial extinction, no longer has the buoyant structure anymore because of forced convection, and there the theory is not valid. But so long within reasonable space, that means within zero to one of this particular ratio, we get a very good match. That means we can predict what will be the corresponding shedding height of the flame in case of forcing. So in hindsight, these are the concluding remarks. So in the concluding remarks, there are three things that we want to emphasize. First is that the droplet flame undergoes self-tuning and shows higher frequency of oscillations, regardless of the degree of forcing for unforced and forced flames. For forcing, the flame shows aggravated response because of the feeding of acoustic energy into the lower frequency bands because of the velocity that is produced henceforth. And lastly, there is a decrease in the shedding height of the flame because of the additional circulation that is produced by this additional velocity that is produced by the acoustics. So it is basically the velocity fluctuations and not the excitation frequency which leads to the flame shedding criteria that we developed. So it will be important that one can superpose different types of these velocity perturbations to synthesize an unsteady flow field that can mimic some kind of a turbulent perturbation of a buoyant droplet diffusion flame. So in other words, this is the acknowledgement, Mr. M.C. Kirti for his help and funding from DRTO Chair Professorship, DST Shorna Jayanti Fellowship, and UGC UKD, and these are the references. Thank you.